afternoon, good evening, clinical problem solvers. Nice to see everyone today. It's Tuesday. It's Neurology Morning Report. Sorry for the delay getting us started today as Maria and I came up with the game plan. Um, so did anyone bring a case, a neurology case they were hoping to discuss? And then we would need two people to discuss that case. Ideally, one identifying as a woman and one identifying as a man. Anyone have a case? Want to discuss the case? Okay, we have a case, backup case always. So not to let you off the hook for some other time when we would like someone to bring a neurology case. It's been a long time that the case hasn't been from Maria. <laughs> Though Maria always brings wonderful cases, so that's fine too. Who would like to discuss? Maria's case today. Oh, it's a case from Valeria. This is going to be a good one. And Valeria spent the last few months in the US, so we don't know if it's from Peru or from the United States to add further mystery. Who would like to discuss the case today? Two discussants, please. Nikita, wonderful. Thank you for joining us. Um, Nick and Amr, great. All right, we have two volunteers. Nikita, Amr, Maria, do you want to introduce yourselves? And then we'll go ahead and get started. Yay, so excited for Nikita and Amr. Uh, I have a case. My name is Maria. I'm a medical student in Guatemala. Well, yeah. Yeah, I'm still a medical student. I'll always call myself a medical student. Uh, I like neurology. Um, and I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Nikita, do you wanna introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Nikita. I'm a recently graduated medical student from India. I'm excited to discuss this case with you all. Wonderful, thank you. Hello guys, my name's Amar. Uh, I'm not sure what I am, but uh, I finished um, all the lab exams. And today, just now, actually, I just got a response from the British Embassy. Very cryptic. It just says your passport is ready for collection. <laughs> they don't tell you you got it or you didn't. So let's hope that uh, I get my visa. Yeah, and uh, very excited to discuss uh, today with you, Nikita. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on your passport and visa. Presumably, if they're inviting you to come pick it up, there's something good inside waiting for you, we hope. Um, and you'll find out. Um, okay. And so for those who might be new today, we're going to hear about a case piece by piece from Maria. None of us know what it is except Maria. And Maria has a very good poker face. So as we discuss, you will not know just from looking at her if we're on the right track or not, and we won't know. So we'll hear a little bits at a time and we'll discuss them with Nikita and Amir and then we'll um, see where we end up. Okay, um, so, and I think um, Leia is helping us with um, some scribing, teaching points, et cetera, yeah? Okay, all right, so Maria, what was the chief concern of the case? All right, so the chief concern was right eyelid drop. Right eyelid drop. Okay. Um, Nikita, do you want to start us off and tell us what you're thinking as you hear this? Um, so right eyelid drop, this is so interesting because I'm used to listening to bilateral eyelid drop, like drooping of the eyelids. I would possibly think of ptosis, but uh, unilateral drop, that's interesting. So. I would probably think it's something to do with a uh, peripheral cause, as in it's something to do with the cranial nerves. So, um, I don't know, it could also be a tumor that's causing this ptosis to behind the orbital, behind the orbit. What else could it be? I don't know. I think I need more information because for now, that's the only um, DDX I have in my mind. Either it's a cranial nerve pathology or it could be a tumor or who knows, it could be a start of some um, demalinating disease that we don't know of, so yeah. Okay, very good. And Nikita, the first thing you said was you were 
surprised to hear it was just on one side. I just wanted to ask you what made you say that? What were you thinking about bilateral um, eyelid drooping? But because I'm uh, used to seeing myasthenia in the clinic with bilateral ptosis, um, but I've never seen a unilateral ptosis in person, though I've read of um, several diagnoses, but the first thing that popped to my mind was myasthenia, but then I read, hey, it's just unilateral. So yeah, that's the reason why I was a little confused. Yeah, great thought. So we're going to try to find all the different localizations for drooping of the eyelid or ptosis, as Nikita said, and um, you gave us several of them, right? It could be a cranial nerve problem. Well, do you know um, which cranial nerve helps elevate the eyelid? Okay, if you don't, Beth. Sorry, three? Yeah, cranial nerve three does so many oc ocular motor functions. It's the oculomotor nerve, and that includes... Um, many of the rectus and oblique muscles, everything except superior oblique, which is done by four, and lateral rectus, which is done by six. And it also has the parasympathetic to constrict the pupil and innervates the levator palpebrae to elevate the eyelid. So we could have some problem with cranial nerve three, as Nikita told us. And then maybe the problem, as she said, is in the orbit itself and somehow affecting the levator um, muscles. Um, older patients can get what's called levator dehiscence, where um, the, the skin there, just for some reason, the whatever, I don't know the names of the anatomical structures, but tendinous or whatever structures there that are holding the lid in place to hiss. And people wonder, do they have a cranial nerve problem? Do they have myasthenia? And it's just a mechanical problem. So you gave us that possibility. And then a neuromuscular junction problem like myasthenia. And you would think since the antibodies are flowing everywhere in the body, that myasthenia would cause bilateral ptosis, but actually often it is uh, unilateral. Patients often have unilateral asymmetric um, ptosis and myasthenia. Okay, so you've given us several possible reasons that a person could have ptosis, a cranial nerve three problem, some mechanical problem um, of the um, lid and a neuromuscular junction problem. Other um, possibilities, uh, Amir, you wanted to add to those and then I can add a few also. So, uh... I was wondering about one one uh, thing. If this was a process affecting the nerve itself, wouldn't we want to expect uh, some other movement abnormalities of the eye? Which, I, I mean, I know sometimes certain processes uh, that are compressive in nature can begin on one side of the nerve and thus start in certain muscles and then affect the rest of the muscles. So that could be a possibility if it was a mechanical process in nature. However, if it was some form of a demyelinating process, I, I would expect other, uh, other, ner other uh, muscles to be affected uh, from, the, from all the six muscles innervated by cranial nerve three. Um, as you've already said, this could be a neuromuscular junction uh, issue or a brain stem uh, disorder. This could be the beginning of uh, multiple sclerosis causing some lesion in the brainstem in a strategic location. Uh, this could be due to some uh, toxins. I mean, we've had a case before of uh, 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 the one that they use in cosmetics, uh, botulism. Um, so at this point, I think it's a little too early, but I do not, I want to say that I do not think it's a cranial nerve three palsy. Yeah, interesting point, right? Cranial nerve three does so many things, right? Cranial nerve four and six each do one thing, but cranial nerve three is one of the nerves that, cranial nerves that does many things. And so you would think if there's ptosis from a cranial nerve three problem, won't there also be double vision from difficulty with eye movements? Won't there also be a large uh, pupil? As you said, the cranial nerve, we think of it as just this one strand, but it actually is multiple fascicles in that nerve. The one that's coming to the pupil, the one that's coming to the superior rectus, medial rectus, those all have um, fascicles within the nerve. They all have subnuclei within um, the midbrain. And it is possible, we know from the uh, herniation syndrome of uncle herniation, right? That the temporal lobe can sometimes push on uh, part of the nerve where the pupillary fibers are, and then you can have the pupil um, become dilated before the other cranial nerve three abnormalities come out. So you're correct, Amir, that you could have um, a process affecting a particular 
part when we have to localize even within the third cranial nerve, um, but it seems less likely if that's truly the only thing. That being said, perhaps this patient has noticed in the mirror that the pupil is drooping, but the muscle problems are not severe enough that they've noticed double vision and they haven't noticed that their pupils are two different sizes. So I don't think we can fully take it off the list, though I agree with you. And as you said, strategic would have to be the world's smallest brainstem lesion just to get the, I think it's the central caudal nucleus of, of three, a subnucleus of the third nerve nucleus complex for the levator, that would seem um, unlikely to get the world's smallest um, brainstem lesion. So we could have, though, in principle, as you said, something from the midbrain through the third nerve to the neuromuscular junction, and then um, the sort of mechanical uh, or muscle themselves. There's another way we can get ptosis, not in this third nerve pathway. Does anyone remember that? Amir or Nikita, another, I'll give you a clue, syndrome um, that can cause per ptosis. Perhaps if there's a loss, a little bit of the fat in the orbit, so maybe the eye could uh, go in like endophthalmus or, or something similar. Uh, I know there's also a muscle, uh, that a small, but tiny muscle that rests under the eye that basically con contracts like this uh, to prop up the eye a little bit. I forgot the name of this one. I think you're referring so maybe, to Mueller's muscle or the tarsal muscle. Is it the same uh, as levator palpebrae superioris or is this a different one? Yeah, it's so the muscle of Mueller then, yeah. Yeah, and so what innervates the Mueller muscle or the tarsal muscle? I think seven. Yeah, so I was confused on that in medical school also, uh, so much so that I, and, and you know, we learn a lot of things and I'm sure you've all seen as you go along that you've learned something and then later you realize you learned it wrong or some of us might say somebody taught it to me wrong or I read it wrong, but we study so hard for medical school. We put lots of good information, but every once in a while you ingrain a mistake. And I ingrained this mistake when I was a neurology resident, someone had ptosis on rounds and I said, well, it could be Bell's palsy and everyone looked at me funny. And I said, but the, 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 there would be facial weakness and, and, and weakness of the eyelid, right? There would be a droop. And they looked at me and I said, no. And I thought, I'm pretty sure I learned it that way. And I went and looked it up and so I just learned it um, the completely wrong way. Because as Kevin innervates amongst many other facial muscles, the orbicularis oculi, which is used to close your eye like the Popeye cartoon when you wink at someone, not just wink, but really make that kind of cartoon-ish wink. And so if that's weak and loose, actually the eye will be more open on the side of a seventh nerve palsy. And as the patient talks to you, you'll see one eye blinking as it normally blinks and the other eye, you'll just see the eyeball rolling up. That spells phenomenon, the eyeball rolls up when you close the eye. So um, you don't see ptosis in a seventh nerve palsy, but you're on the right track, uh, Amir, that there are other muscles aside from the later palpebrae called Mueller's muscle or tarsal muscles. And those have a separate innervation from cranial nerve three. Do you know what innervates those? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Yeah, Someone what innervates that, that tarsal or Mueller's muscle that you mentioned? I'll give you uh, a clue. I, uh... I think it's the sympathetic fibers. I, I, someone said it in the chat, and I'm like, oh yeah, definitely, because yeah. you do see you do see enophthalmus in uh, um, the syndrome of the loss of sympathetic innervation of the face. Um, yes. What's the name uh, of that uh, syndrome? Ptosis, <laughs> you know? meiosis, enophthalmus, and hydrosis. Um, Horner. Ptosis, yeah. meiosis, and hydrosis. The rhyming triad of Horner. Yeah, of Horner syndrome. Yeah. So we always forget this and everyone always thinks of the third nerve palsy and eyelid drooping or ptosis, but the Horner syndrome There's is an ophthalmus as well. Yeah. yeah, can do, can do. And so um, I believe it can do. I don't think of that as part of the sort of initial, um, you know, uh, the triad, but um, uh, I, I believe you, I would have to look it up. I'm not, I'm, I'm not familiar with that aspect of it. So um so, right, so when we say wide-eyed with fear, right, when you open your eyelids, these are the tarsal or Mueller's muscles and the sympathetic pathways are, are making your eyes big. And we say, right, that you see the tiger and your eyes get really big and the pupils dilate and you open your eyes. That's the sympathetic pathway. It's a very complicated um, pathway that 
starts in the hypothalamus, descends through the dorsolateral brainstem. That's why you can get a Horner's in lateral medullary syndrome. It goes all the way down to C8T1. I think it's called the sympathetic nucleus of budge or something like this in the spinal cord. As a second order neuron that comes out, goes over the lung apex. That's why you can get Horner's from a apical lung tumor. And then actually travels up with the um, uh, uh, carotid. And that's why you can get a Horner syndrome from a carotid dissection and goes up through the cavernous sinus and then out to the orbit. And the facial sweating fibers for the anhydrosis actually split off and travel with the external carotid while the uh, fibers for the um, pupil uh, and the um, lid travel with the internal carotid. So you can actually localize this Horner's based on whether the facial sweating is impacted or not, though it's very hard to tell whether the face is sweating, but you can look up online Harlequin syndrome and you will see that patients sometimes when they have facial sweating absence on one side, they get out of a hot shower or a sauna or they exercise and they look in the mirror and see one side of the face is flushed and the other side is not um, flushed. I always forget whether it's the Horner side or the other side. One got maybe too hot because it couldn't sweat and so it flushes or is it the Horner's pathway impairment that causes them able to uh, flush, um, but I, I forget. Um, the key uh, thing about the ptosis here in Horner's is actually pretty subtle. So if you have a full third nerve palsy, the lid is down. It's down like a curtain, right? When, if I'm talking to the medical students, right, and say, what does the third nerve palsy look like? Everyone says the eyes down and out. And they always say, oh, well, trick question. You don't see anything the lid is down. And when you lift it, yes, the eye is down and out. But a third nerve palsy, the eyelid will be completely down. And the ptosis in Horner is actually quite subtle. And once you notice it the first time, then you look at everyone, everyone's eyes are a little bit uh, asymmetric and you start thinking everyone has a Horner syndrome, um, which is not the case. But there's also what's called inverse ptosis because some of that wide-eyed bathura is opening the lower lid. So Horner's, there'll actually be a slight elevation of the lower lid and a slight depression of the upper lid and the eye appears smaller on that side. And then the pupil in the Horner should be small because the sympathetic is out, so the pupil is small, whereas the pupil in a third nerve palsy should be big because the parasympathetic is out, right? So a Horner's, we'd see subtler ptosis, we'd see the small pupil, um, and we shouldn't see any eye movement abnormalities unless the lesions in the cavernous sinus, then we're going to see all kinds of different uh, things. Um, so those are the basic possibilities here. We could have a, something along the third nerve pathway. We could have something along the Horner's pathway. We could have something at the neuromuscular junction like myasthenia, um, or we could have some mechanical uh, problem around the lid. Um, any other causes of ptosis we can think of? Um, we talked about nerve pathway, neuromuscular junction. So there are uh, muscular dystrophies. There are many genetic muscular dystrophies. There's one called oculopharyngeal muscular dystrophy. I think it's more common in French Canadians. And they have, just like the name sounds like oculo and pharyngeal weakness is the primary features of, of that. And so they often have ptosis, eye movement, abnormalities, and um, dysarthria, dysphagia. Um, I think you can get ptosis in botulism. That's a neuromuscular junction disorder. I've never seen botulism, but um, those are some of the possibilities here. So as we hear the history, we'll want to know, of course, did this just fall down suddenly? Are there any associated abnormalities to make us think of one of these pathways uh, versus the other. For myasthenia, Nikita will want to know if it fluctuates, that the patient notices is not that bad in the morning, right? But it gets worse as the day goes on, um, those, those sorts of things. Um, all right, I think we've squeezed every drop we can out of, out of unilateral ptosis, but um, we'll see if we missed anything as we go. Okay, Maria, can we get more than three words to discuss now? <laughs> Yeah, let's see if I can answer some of your questions. So this is a 70-year-old male with four days of mild to moderate can balance with drift to the left side while walking um, and double vision um, since the last four days. One day before admission, his knees noticed his right eyelid was drooping, so they took him to the ER, um, and there he developed shortness of breath at rest. He denies chest pain, fever, weight loss, headache, nausea, or vomiting, or any other symptoms. Um, would you mind telling us the age of the patient? Oh, yeah, 70. 70. 70. 70. 70. So 70, 
And then did you say four days ago, something happened suddenly or something has been emerging and evolving over a few days? So four days ago, he started with imbalance to with drift to the left side and double vision. Then he progressed to having the, the right eyelid drop. And then in the emergency room, he progressed to shortness of breath. So it's been sort of slowly progressing over four days. Okay. Um, I think you're up first this time, Amir. Um, what do you make of one or more of these pieces of information? So we want to try to localize uh, the lesion, and uh, we have uh, lots of uh, good clues, I think. So imbalance, uh, so imbalance could be lots of things. Uh, eyelid, uh, let's say double vision. I'm, I'm going to assume that it is due to the, the small muscles uh, moving the eye being affected. So it can be a lot of things. So I'm trying to think uh, of where do they intersect uh, together and perhaps add on the shortness of breath uh, at the end to see if uh, I can localize it. So uh, I think uh, this, uh, the, the first thing I'm uh, thinking of is a brainstem uh, lesion because that's uh, th there you can get your, uh, uh, you can affect the balance as well as uh, the eye uh, muscles. Um, I would like to know if uh, the uh, double vision is uh, persistent if he closes uh, the affected the right eye or does it go away? Um, um, I know I, I know there is some significance to the side to which you drift to while walking, though I cannot recall what that uh, significance is. But I do know it has, um, it, it, there was something about it in uh, our neuro textbooks. So the imbalance, uh, if it was a cerebral, a, a cerebellar lesion, I don't see how that would cause uh, eye uh, problems. If it was further down in the brainstem, then definitely. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know if I have uh, more to offer, maybe uh, in a little while. And the shortness of breath, uh, I think, is very interesting. Uh, this could be perhaps because uh, of uh, some pneumonia that is developing. And that can happen with aspiration if the patient did indeed have a brainstem lesion. Um, or it could be uh, unrelated. Or it could be a progression of uh, some neuromuscular disorder, and now it's affecting the respiratory muscles. So uh, we're everyone's familiar with the Miller-Fisher variant that would start from the top down, but it still would not affect the diaphragm so early as to cause shortness of breath. Um, but still, it's a possibility. Uh, it could be. Uh, yeah, I think the progression is perhaps a little too fast for a multiple sclerosis type of picture, but I'm not very familiar with these. Uh, so I, I think I've exhausted my differentials. Yeah, well, um, it's an exhaustive um, differential, and I like how you approach this. There's so much here. And one question that you were sort of asking is, how do we relate all of this first to one? lesion, if we can, patients can have multiple lesions, can have multiple disease processes. And, but as a, not just intellectual exercise, but for parsimony, right, of nature, which is often parsimonious to think this patient might have one disease process causing one lesion as a first pass to see if we can make sense of it that way. But still to do that, right, we kind of need to analyze these separately and see where all our axes line up. So as you said, imbalance is you know, um, can be sort of anything, right? That could be a sensory problem uh, with proprioception. That could be ataxia. The patient could just be weak on one side and report it as imbalance. So that is not going to help us too much, but is the first symptom. So it's important and we can't, certainly can't ignore it. As you mentioned, falling to one side um, typically is described with um, either a unilateral cerebellar lesion and the people fall to that side, or I think can also be with a vestibular 
lesion. I forget if people fall to the same or the opposite side, but not, I think, a perfect sign. There's this, um, it has an eponym. It's a marching in place test. Is it the Fukuda marching test um, where you have the patient close their eyes and march in place? I think it's with a cerebellar. I would guess probably also a vestibular, but I would have to look it up. And when their eyes are closed, they start actually rotating um, from the starting point of where they were marching and presumably toward the side of the lesion, but also uh, not perfect. Double vision, as you said, also sort of helps us, but, but um, still leaves a lot of possibilities because it could be a problem in the brain stem. So double vision means the eyes are misaligned unless it's, as you said, monocular double vision, meaning some problem with the lens. But if patient closes either eye and the double vision goes away, we know the eyes are misaligned. That could be from any of the cranial nerves involved in eye movements, three, four, or six, can be from the neuromuscular junction, can be from the eye muscles themselves in an orbital myopathy or thyroid eye disease, can be from an internuclear ophthalmoplegia from the MLF. So we're still sort of in the brainstem cranial nerve category where we were with ptosis, but um, doesn't necessarily help us. And then we get this shortness of breath, and what do we do with that? And I like your first impulse that does this patient have a neurologic process that led them to aspirate and caused a pneumonia, or does this patient have some type of rapidly progressing neuromuscular process, which is now also affecting the muscles of respiration? I think all of that is um, on the table. Um, um, other thoughts in the Kita before I go further? Um, yeah, um, when I was hearing the HPI, I was taken on a journey because when I heard imbalance with drift to left side, I suddenly thought it could be a cerebellar cause, but then quickly remembered that this person has a right eyelid droop. So maybe that makes sense why he would drift to the left side because um, the, he, the left side would be the dominant side of vision. So that's why I thought the the person might be drifting to the left side. Uh, but then also uh, to uh, this person is 70 years old. So uh, maybe if he was an earlier smoker, it could be a lung carcinoma causing the pancreas tumor, then Horner's syndrome, that was one part I thought of, or he could be 70 and is a sedentary person, didn't really experience like muscle weakness. It could be a... It could be a very fast deteriorating myasthenia gravis causing shortness of breath. It could be that causing acute respiratory failure. Like, uh, yeah, but I'm probably intrigued to know uh, where this case is going to go. How's, how's the prognosis of the patient going to be? But as of now, um, it could be anything. And I think we covered all bases in terms of DDX. So that's the only thing I could contribute. Yeah, well, that's it. Those are excellent contributions. I agree. Yeah, it's um, it seems what we're hearing from the history is that the patient had something neurological and then developed, it sounds like relatively sudden onset of shortness of breath. Um, although, as you said, maybe there was some latent shortness of breath, the patient didn't notice, they were sedentary. And as a result, um, something has happened to decompensate on top of that. And so the idea of a lung tumor with a Horner's uh, syndrome could be considered, though then that wouldn't explain the cerebellar or double vision. So, um, yeah, when I first heard imbalance a few days ago and we had this toasted on top of it, I also wondered, does this patient have some type of, did this patient have four days ago and we're seeing the patient a few days in, but had a sudden event and has some type of um, lateral medullary syndrome with some cerebellar findings with the Horner syndrome for ptosis. Um, if you're at the medulla, you shouldn't be getting double vision though, because three, four and six, three and four come out of the midbrain and six out of the pons. And you can get, um, a, uh, not with lateral, well, not, I'm actually not sure. With medullary um, lesions, you can affect the, um, the respiratory nuclei and um, get, get some type of respiratory problem. I, I haven't seen that, but I've seen it reported that a well-placed multiple sclerosis plaque or something in medulla causes autonomic uh, dysfunction. Um, but, um, okay, so, and then uh, I think Amir or, or Nikita, I think Amir mentioned um, Guillain-Barre as a possibility here, right? We have something rapidly progressive with lots of neurologic findings, including the cranial nerves, the respiratory muscles, um, and could the eye and imbalance be a package of the um, ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, and we haven't seen the reflexes yet. Are they there? And then you might say, but Miller-Fisher, isn't that just the triad? Well, some patients have sort of overlap with or evolve to full-blown um, Guillain-Barre syndrome and have 
um, the respiratory muscles involved as well. Um, so I think all of these are possibilities. I think the idea of a, of a, of a stroke sort of at ictus and then the patient just has those symptoms persistently seems less likely. He does seem to be accumulating deficit. He seems to be accumulating them pretty quickly over four days. So that would be acute. And just coming back to first principles, if the localization is very convoluted here because there's so many possibilities we've discussed, but this is not sudden, right? So it's not um, a stroke. Um, and I guess you could say, does the patient have some type of fixed vertebral or basilar stenosis and is throwing off little um, emboli to all artery to artery, all to the same sort of territory, but um, over a couple of days, I guess could do, I still would have trouble explaining the shortness of breath, at least through common um, mechanisms. Um, or does this patient have sort of more what we would think of in a four day time course of some type of inflammatory or infectious process? And if we call this an inflammatory, largely peripheral process, remember the cranial nerves are peripheral nerves, except for cranial nerve two, that um, the patient has Guillain-Barre. Um, or does the patient have uh, myasthenia and is presenting with a very aggressive form progressing right away to crisis, which can occur. And myasthenia has a sort of bimodal um, age presentation with younger women and older men. So this person would be in the demographic of an older man and a first presentation of myasthenia. Imbalance with myasthenia, I have a little bit of trouble explaining. They shouldn't be ataxic. They shouldn't have sensory difficulties, but maybe this is um, weakness, or maybe as Nikita said, maybe this was the patient's way of describing um, that it was hard to move with, with double vision um, if we stretch it a little bit. So I guess I would be thinking of something in the periphery at this point um, and Guillain-Barre or um, uh, first presentation of myasthenia, I guess, are, are bubbling up higher on my uh, list. Um, okay, well, we're perplexed and interested and Curious to hear what other information you want to give us, Maria. Okay, give me one minute. I lost it, but here we go. Okay. Here we go. Today, the southwest corner is going to be packed with surprises. Uh oh, I budgeted my time. <laughs> Not in a good way. Okay, go ahead. Um, so past medical history, uh, the person had a left clear cell renal carcinoma, uh, and he had a nephrectomy uh, performed the same year. Um, and he's on immunotherapy with pembrolizumab. Uh, he's also, he also has hypertension, and he had a DVT in both his right and left leg. Uh, he was treated with an IVC, IVC filter, and it, it, it has been removed. Um, Family history, he has a sibling uh, who had a brain tumor. Social history, nothing relevant. And his meds include hydrochlorothiazide, lisinopril, rivaroxaban, um, aspirin, and pembrolizumab. Okay. Um, thoughts, Amir or Nikita, on this new information, how it may affect our thinking? Uh, I went um, last last time, so Nikita, if you want to go. <laughs> yeah, I can sure. also um, go first, I don't mind. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, I don't really Ladies have first. much to offer. Um, I think uh, uh, the fact that this person already had a carcinoma, uh, could it be a malignancy? Could it be a syndromic presentation? Is, is, is there another malignancy that is yet to be discovered? I don't know. Um, also the medications, I don't know a whole lot about uh, the side effects of this MAB, but yeah, I don't really know. I'm still stuck with the DDX that we found at the end of the HPI, but I'm interested to know more about the examination. So I think that's, goal for me compared to this, but let's see. Yeah, I agree. The exam is going to be um, telling here. So yeah, one of my mentors like to say, if the patient presents to a neurologist with a history of cancer, um, it's almost always going to have something to do with the cancer, but um, that's not always true. Almost always, he said. And the way I like to frame this, as I think we've discussed before, is the neurology of cancer can be related to tumor itself, meaning either metastases or the primary tumor pressing on some neurologic structure. So 
direct involvement or compression can be a complication of therapy, chemo or radiation, or can be perineoplastic, right? So um, if we think in those three buckets here, renal cell carcinoma metastatic to where here, right? To cause all of this stuff and so quickly, um, be a little atypical, right? You can get leptomeningeal metastases. We had a case in a podcast of that in the last months where it's actually affecting the meninges and the cranial nerves and the, and the patients develop cranial neuropathies, but usually not at this pace. And then one mass of renal cell carcinoma somewhere in the nervous system causing all of this seems a little less likely, um, though cancer can do anything. And uh, where I used to work, I did a lot of consultations for an oncology hospital and you know, anything someone would say, I've never seen this before, then you would see it. Um, um, because when you see so many patients with um, cancer, you even see rare complications of those cancers and the therapies. Um, so in this case, probably not the cancer because it'd be hard to find one place or even multiple places to put it to cause all of this and why over four days of this metastases. Paraneoplastic or antibody-mediated syndromes, which syndrome would this be? We've said we'd have to be in the brainstem cranial nerves. There are rhombencephalitis uh, syndromes with perineoplastic. There's a recently described, is it Kelch 11? Um, uh, to update my textbook, I had a one-page uh, table of all the antibodies that can cause neurologic symptoms, perineoplastic and non-perineoplastic. And the second edition of my book, it's now two pages because so many new antibodies. And there's one, I think it's Kelch 11 that can cause a sort of brainstem cerebellum. I think it's associated with testicular cancer. Somebody fact check me. Kelch, Kelch-like protein 11 um, was one of the new ones that I learned. Um, I think the recently described GFAP, glial fibrillary acidic protein, I think is what it stands for, can cause um, a sort of meningeal um, process. I haven't seen cases of these yet, so I don't have a strong um, uh, knowledge or understanding of them. But could this be an antibody mediated? Again, you'd have to say, what is the syndrome here? And a brainstem, what we'd call rhombencephalitis. Yes, there are antibodies that can do this. And um, I've mentioned a few that I think can do it, but I could be wrong. Someone can check me. Um, and then we come into the chemo and radiation um, column. And here, this patient is on pembrolizumab, immune checkpoint inhibitor. And this has spawned almost a whole new field, you know, subfield of neurology is the neurologic complications of checkpoint inhibitors. And you can find lots of articles on this, but um, the most common neurologic manifestations, as far as I understand from my reading and what I've seen, are in the periphery. So they can get a Guillain-Barre syndrome, they can get myasthenia, they can get myositis, and they can get um, carditis, they can get hypophysitis, and then there are other rare things. But So what if we wondered if this patient has a pem pembrolizumab toxicity causing a Guillain-Barre-like syndrome and a myocarditis or a myasthenia? like syndrome and myocarditis. And my understanding is, although again, this is a new and rapidly evolving area. So if someone knows more or someone is fact checking and looking us up um, right now, um, let me know. But I believe you often see things together, right? So you can see myasthenia and myositis. So you can see my myasthenia and myocarditis or hypophysitis and Guillain-Barre um, syndrome. So not to get biased too much by one piece of new information, but that's a pretty important piece that pembrolizumab and does this person have a checkpoint inhibitor associated um, neurologic syndrome? And these get very complicated. They need to be treated with steroids. And then if the patient needs this therapy for their cancer, but it's had, they've had this neurologic complication, can they be switched to another PD or PDL1 uh, inhibitor? These are tricky um, cases. So, um, Whatever the syndrome is, if it was in one of those columns, direct effect of cancer seems a little less likely to me. Perineoplastic, I think, possible. Um, and then um, pembrolizumab associated would probably be the most common. Um, so that's the main signal coming out of that southwest corner for me. Um, so on the exam, we're going to want to know what that pupil looks like, which cranial nerves are affected here. Um, what type of ptosis it is. So many things we're wondering about in the cranial nerve exam. And then how do we explain this imbalance? Is the patient ataxic on one side? Do they have sensory deficits? Are they weak? And then um, the shortness of breath, we still don't have an explanation for. Um, okay, Maria, what was found on the exam? 
I'm like live texting Vale. She's at the hospital. And I'm like discussing it with her. Um, I can't wait for her to see it. Um, so vitals were normal, uh, a little bit hypertensive, heart rate of 102, respiratory rate of 22. Um, he is in acute distress. Um, the breath sounds are decreased in both lung bases. And for the neuro exam, He's alert and oriented in time, space, and person. He has right ptosis and impaired adduction uh, of both of bilateral eyes, normal visual fields by confrontation, no pupil abnormalities. Um, muscle strength is five out of five in four extremities. Uh, symmetric sensitivity to light and thin brick touch. The patellar and Achilles reflexes are zero four. Bilaterally, the biceps reflexes are one out of four and bilaterally. Uh, normal alternating movements, no dysmetria, no diarrhea. I can't say that. Can't be a neurologist. And March could not be assessed because uh, he was connected to a bunch of IV. Okay, so unilateral ptosis, bilateral. AB or AD duction? AD duction, normal motor, reflexes. I think you said some places they were zero and some places they were one. Yeah, um, patellar and Achilles reflexes, zero out of four, and biceps reflexes, one out of four. I'm assuming the others were normal because she didn't mention them. Yeah, and then no motor sensory attacks, uh, cerebellar findings. Okay. I forget who's first, we've all just been talking, um, but we should be able to have a better sense of the syndrome, at least at this point or parts of it. So um, Nikita, Amir, I forget who's where, but feel free either of you to comment on one or more parts of this. I think uh, my, my turn, uh, though I hope it wasn't my turn. Uh, so uh, yeah, in the last, Bart, I was uh, very zoomed in on the burn brolizumab from the beginning because I know I I know these ones uh, are very commonly causing lots of weird neurological syndromes. So immediately I googled it and saw a few uh, ocular uh, so many ocular cases being reported of uh, ocular myositis or myasthenia gravis like uh, processes. But I'm not sure if uh, if it would still work now. Um, so from the things that we got, did I, did I hear that uh, the biceps reflexes are one out of five on both sides? But the reflexes like in the knees are normal or do we not know that? Absent. In On the knees. Okay. Um, uh, for some reason I thought, uh, Oh yeah, okay, here, here it is. So this is, uh, I think, uh, more of a global process now. Uh, symmetrical, it does seem. And uh, I think progressive. So if we, they, well, there aren't that many things in um, that can be this. We have not heard anything, any, we have not heard if it's fatigable yet or not to start thinking about myasthenia or, or uh, not, but I'm gonna assume that uh, this is not a fatigable process and it is like that when the patient wakes up and when he goes to sleep. And if that is the case, I think um, this really feels like um, um, Miller-Fisher or Guillain-Barre. However, the, the, the there's a, a little bit of some specificity when it comes to the bilateral adduction uh, palsy of the eyes, which I think can only happen in an internuclear lesion, um, which, um, which is something that I would associate with uh, multiple sclerosis, but I do not think this is a multiple sclerosis picture at all. It's too symmetrical and... Uh, so I don't know what could be causing that. Could still be as a consequence of the uh, burn brolizumab. 
I'm not sure if we're missing anything here. Oh, yeah, uh, there is dystiadecokinesia, uh, <laughs> my favorite word, um, which I believe means uh, they cannot do the alternating uh, movements uh, quickly, right? When, when you ask them to do this. Uh, yeah, that was yeah. normal, I think, in this case, yeah. Oh, no dystatic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So no, no cerebellar. Uh, yeah. I, 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 that's, that's what I have. I think this is uh, uh, something antibody mediated and probably against uh, acetylcholine receptors. Maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. So excellent thoughts. Um, I think one of the strongest pieces of information here is the reflexes, right? Because that tells us there's some lower motor neuron process going on here in the roots or nerves. And myasthenia should not affect the reflexes, the neuromuscular junction, yes, but the reflexes um, uh, are not affected in postsynaptic neuromuscular junction diseases. In Lambert-Eaton syndrome, they can be affected actually, and they can improve with exercise. I've never seen Lambert-Eaton syndrome, but that uh, is reported. But in muscle disease or neuromuscular junction disease, the reflexes should actually be normal. So that gives us actually some pretty hard evidence that we're in the peripheral nervous system somewhere. The ptosis, you asked a very good question. Is it fatigable? Well, you can test that on the exam. You can have the patient look up at the ceiling. I always tell the patient it's the most boring test in medicine for them, not for us, because we just say, look up at the ceiling for a minute. And you watch that totic eye and see if the ptosis continues to kind of get worse as it fatigues, or there's lots of tests, uh, myasthenic, uh, myasthenia bedside tests. You can have the patient um, try to squeeze the eye shut real tight. And if that lid is fatigable, it's called the peak sign that I will start peeking out if the ptosis is fatigable. Sometimes if you lift the other eyelid, um, uh, or if you lift the totic eyelid slightly, you'll see the other one go down. This is Herring's law that there's symmetric neural input to both eyes. So if you actually help the totic eyelid, that extra energy that was trying to lift it and overflowing a little bit to the other eye will relax and that lid will go down a little bit. There's Kogan's lid twitch where you have the patient look down and then look quickly up and the lid will sort of quiver uh, a little bit. You can find nice YouTube um, videos of all of these. And then there's the ice pack test where for some reason cold will improve neuromuscular transmission and you can um, put ice over the patient's eyelid and take a before and after picture. And if the lid sort of pops up after the ice, then that's also highly suggestive of, of myasthenia. So uh, we need more information to know what to do with that ptosis. Good for you, uh, impaired adduction, right? The medial rectus is innervated by three. So why would you get just the medial rectus and nothing else from three, at least on one side, maybe the medial rectus and ptosis, but why not the pupil? Why not the superior and inferior rectus, the inferior oblique, all that other stuff? Um, so you asked a very good question. Could that be an INO or a bilateral INO, the MLFs? cross and run very close to each other in the brainstem. And you can get bilateral INO from a single lesion. Um, we'd love to know if the patient can converge. If the patient can converge, that shows us that the third nerve and medial rectus works. We've just activated it through a different pathway. Um, for the patient to have bilateral INO would take us back into the parenchyma of the brain and away from sort of the periphery. We'd have to be invoking sort of two separate things there. So I wonder if this is whatever process is causing the reflexes to be impaired has caused some, um, what appears symmetric, but is not complete um, ophthalmo, ophthalmoparesis. Um, you could also get this from orbital muscle disease, right? Where you just got both medial recti, but statistically, if you had thyroid eye disease, why would you just get both of the medial recti on both sides? Why would it be so symmetric and specific? A little hard to say, but to have bilateral INO and nothing else from the brainstem you can get, as you said, from MS or a small stroke back there, there's a syndrome called Webino, which is wall-eyed bilateral INO, where in addition to getting the bilateral INO, the eyes are wall-eyed or pointing towards the walls. I'm not sure I understand exactly the detailed neuro-ophthalmological explanation for that, but you can see. Um, and then there's some respiratory things. So again, is that neuromuscular? Well, we can look at the patient's vital capacity at the bedside have them take as deep a breath as possible and then count as high as they can on one breath. And every 10 corresponds to about a liter of vital capacity. We'll often do that when we see a patient with Guillain-Barre or myasthenia to get a sense at the bedside, they're counting to 50, they have about five liters. The next day they're counting to 30. There's some, you know, are things moving in the wrong uh, direction here? 
but I think on balance, it's the reflexes that do it for me. Now he is 70. We didn't, he's had a lot of medical history. We don't know if he got other toxic chemo way back with that cancer and gave him a chemotherapy associated neuropathy and the reflexes are, are, are not relevant, but um, be nice to see old notes and know what chemo he got. And if we can exonerate that, he doesn't have diabetes. Um, any other reason those reflexes should be down, but if that's all new, um, then I think that can help us pin this case on the peripheral nervous system and the respiratory uh, weakness being related to that as well. And that would all make me pretty worried about um, pembrolizumab toxicity here. And you might say the patient's been on it for a long time, but it can be after multiple um, cycles of this. That's sort of where I've anchored. By anchoring there, am I missing other things? Well, if this patient does have Guillain-Barre, we'd probably worry about blaming that drug. It'd be hard to know um, either way. And it does matter because the treatment for Guillain-Barre not associated with checkpoint inhibitors is IVIG or plasma exchange, but when it's associated with the checkpoint inhibitors, unless it's changed since I've last read about this, steroids are recommended, which are not supposed to be effective in, in idiopathic or sort of sporadic Guillain-Barre. So we're getting close to the end of the hour and hopefully not too many more twists and turns. What tests, if any, would help us secure this diagnosis of, of uh, something in the spectrum of, of Guillain-Barre here? Um, Nikita, I think Amir spoke last and Nikita, if you were going to get one or more tests here to at least convince ourselves that we're in the peripheral nervous system and we're in the peripheral nervous system, what would you think? Um, I don't really know um, what I could possibly do because um, we could run more tests, if anything, in terms of like, I don't know any. EMG, but um, uh, I had a doubt, could this also be botulism? Because um, it's a four day exposure period, I could think like that because it's in four days. And once I heard that the deep tendon reflexes were lost, um, myasthenia was out the door, but I know in botulism, we do have deep tendon reflex loss. So, I mean, that's the only thought that was going in my brain, the whole virus. But in terms of your question, Dr. Berkowitz, I, I don't really know what much could I do in terms of examination, because I think uh, this is pretty revealing on its own. Yeah. Have you seen cases of botulism, Nikita? I've never seen a case. I have only seen infantile botulism. I haven't seen um, in adults, but just today I was reading botulism because I'm signing for step two, and I know that an equandidal toxin is given for adults and for less than one year old, uh, infants, we give a uh, human derived uh, specific immunoglobulin. So I was learning about that, but I read there is adult botulism. So that's the reason why I thought, hey, maybe this person did have an exposure that we did not know about. Yeah, right. Maybe we're getting biased by all of this context and the patient could still get botulism. It's um, pretty uncommon. Um, and I've never seen infantile or um, adult, but I've read about it. And um, I believe it's described as a descending paralysis that the eyes are involved <clears throat> or the uh, eyes and cranial nerve muscles are involved. First, I think there's also dysarthria, dysphagia. There's often an abdominal sort of prodrome of nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, all those types of symptoms. And I forget the classic pentad, but the pupils are often affected in that pentad, but it's <clears throat> when I read about it, not fully sensitive. You can have normal pupils. Um, and I, don't remember what it does to the reflexes, but you may be right since it's presynaptic like Lambert Eaton. Um, yeah, that would be something not to miss. Many years ago when I was a resident, I didn't see the patient, but residents made a diagnosis of, um, it was one of the rare types of botulism that you get, I think from, from eating some type of fish, type E botulism. Anyway, it became a New England Journal CPC. I think William David is the discussant. It's probably 10 years old, but it's a very good, CPC on localizing within the neuromuscular um, system, and then all these different types of botulism and how you call the CDC, at least in the US, to get the antitoxin. And it was one of the rare cases where they did an emergency EMG overnight to prove the diagnosis so they could get the, because um, it takes time for the investigation to investigate the food, if they know what food was there or to get the toxin back, I think from the stool. 
And if you have the presynaptic EMG pattern of facilitation, which we don't have time to get into, you can make the diagnosis and get the, whatever it is, the antitoxin um, released from that. I think it's from the CDC. Although, as you said, there's a hotline, Nikita, I think for this step, right, for how you get the infant one and how you get the adult one, and one maybe from horse, I think, as you said, and one is, is, is human. Anyway, um, yeah, could be something unrelated to any of this. And, and in the differential for Guillain-Barre, there aren't too many things that cause an acute polyneuropathy. Guillain-Barre is one, botulism is one, acute heavy metal poisoning, um, is one in botulism, I should say, it's neuromuscular junction, but can give you that picture of an acute sort of peripheral process. So I think if we wanted to confirm that we're in the peripheral nerves, we could do a nerve conduction study, right? And that would help us see if that, what the nerves, uh, how they're behaving, and if this is demyelinating or axonal process, I would presume the pembrolizumab associated inflammatory neuropathies are demyelinating, but I actually don't know for sure. Um, and we wanted to prove that this is inflammatory. I don't think we really need that proof, as you said, with this history in the pembrolizumab, you could do a spinal tap and look for albuminocytologic dissociation where the protein is elevated and the cells are disproportionately less elevated or not elevated at all. Um, that's always taught and learned in the context of Guillain-Barre, but it's actually nonspecific for an, some type of inflammatory process. And you might say, wait, it's a peripheral nervous system process. Why is the CSF Inflammatory, well, remember Guillain-Barre AIDP, the P is not polyneuropathy, but polyradiculoneuropathy, and those roots pass through the CSF compartment, and so that's why you can see some inflammation there. So I think I would be calling this pembrolizumab Guillain-Barre until proven otherwise and be um, mobilizing steroids and thinking about nerve conduction studies. But um, what happened, Maria, for Valle and her colleagues? No, oh, okay. I'm gonna give you tons of tests and then no, we'll figure out the thing. Okay. Uh, so CDC normal BMP normal-ish. Uh, troponins were elevated. Um, Equac panel was subnormal, but due to the rivaroxaban. Uh, liver panel a little bit high. Then they did a couple of imaging. Brain CT no acute abnormality. Uh, chest x-ray, bilateral atelectasis of the lung basis, and a PET CT with no signs of residual malignancy or metastatic disease. They didn't do a CSF uh, because of the anticoagulation, and they did run two antibodies. Uh, so postsynaptic acetylcholine receptor antibodies were positive, and anticoagulocyte anti antibodies were negative. And yeah, <laughs> I'll give you a second and then I'll, I'll tell you what Valley texted me. Okay, so anti-acetylcholine receptor antibodies are associated with what disease? Myasthenia. Yeah, myasthenia gravis. Um, that's where we began, right? That was Nikita's first thought. We have ptosis, <laughs> myasthenia, that's a good association. The only thing that for me wouldn't really be explained by that are the reflexes, although maybe there's like I said, maybe the patient got a platen or a taxane earlier and those are old. Be nice to look in notes and see if anyone ever checked the reflexes before. Usually if the patient hasn't seen a neurologist, nobody has. So public service announcement for you in primary care, please check and document the reflexes. So we know if they were there before or not, that helps us know whether we should be highlighting these in red here or not. Um, because all the eye stuff together would, would be a nice package for myasthenia. Why impaired adduction? You can get something called a pseudo INO. You can get a pseudo anything with the eyes in myasthenia. And so always in the differential for some unexplained diplopia is, is myasthenia. Um, or if that reflex problem is new, as I mentioned, I believe in the reports I've read, some of these patients can get sort of multiple pembrolizumab or, or checkpoint inhibitor toxicities together. Does this patient have some of both. The gangliocyte antibodies are associated with Guillain-Barre, but they aren't always there depending on which syndrome it is. So that they're negative doesn't help us that much. So are we calling this myasthenia and tossing the reflexes or attributing them to something else? Or are we saying it's myasthenia and something else um, going on? Um, what did uh, Valle and her colleagues uh, come up with for this one, Maria? <laughs> So they started treating for myasthenia uh, with uh, plasma exchange. The patient did improve, but a couple of days later, 
he got a, oh, I forgot, but something like a hard block or give me one second. Yeah, like a, a third degree hard block. Uh, so they started thinking about this autonomy and things like that, or pembrolizumab toxicity. Um, so they treated at the end as pembrolizumab toxicity and myasthenia gravis with plasmapheresis and steroids. That was the case. Okay, wow. So right, the heart is that patient's short of breath from myasthenia, but I wouldn't think they should be dumping troponin. And so, as I mentioned, a lot of these patients can get myocarditis and can have myositis, myocarditis, myositis, myasthenia, myasthenia, myocarditis. I think that's probably the explanation here. So I guess I went um, too heavy on the reflexes here. Um, so I don't know if Maria Valle knows if that was a red herring from before or someone wasn't no. using a good hammer or we just don't know. We don't know. Uh, they, they pursue GBS syndrome throughout like the entire course until the end with when the antibiotics panel proved differently. Um, so I, I, there's, there's still like, she's not 100% sure with the team if it's GBS, Revis, okay. Fembrolizumab. Um, so I think it could still be a little bit of everything or nothing. <laughs> that would be a little bit I think if you were seeing the patient, maybe looking at them, and if we could see signs of fatigability and those things, we'd say there's definitely myasthenia, and I don't know what to do with the reflexes, or the, the fatigability is not entirely clear, and I'm not sure what to make of these reflexes. Maybe it's some of both, but hard not to point the finger at pembrolizumab and treat for either slash both with steroids, as was done, um, especially given the myocarditis as well. If you wanted for academic intellectual purposes or in the early days of these checkpoint inhibitors when we were seeing all the stuff and no one had the reports yet to know what you're seeing, you might consider doing a nerve conduction study and EMG to say, oh yes, there's a decrement with, high, with uh, repetitive stimulation of low frequency consistent with a neuromuscular junction problem and there is conduction block and, and absent or decreased F waves and H reflexes and all this uh, stuff to suggest that there is also Guillain-Barre, so you could report it as such. I remember in the early days of these checkpoint inhibitors, I was consulted to see a patient who was on one, I think it was ipilimumab and had arm weakness. It was my early day, early on in being an attending and I couldn't recognize a pattern that I would have recognized on an exam, which was an anterior interosseous neuropathy, um, which is a branch of the median nerve that does the um, flexor digitorum profundus one and two flexor pollicis longus, and I think pronator quadratus, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, was it, and the scapula was winging. I knew it was a brachial plexus thing. And I realized, oh, this is Parsonage-Turner syndrome, which is an inflammatory brachial neuritis. And I thought, I wonder if it's the checkpoint inhibitor. And I asked the oncologist and he said, oh yeah, there's tons of this. And I said, tons of it? <laughs> Where? We didn't find it. He said, oh, you'll see. It's not being, it's still being reported. But the early days of these drugs, there was tons of neurology and every case was sort of very novel and you would report it and do a lot of testing to characterize what it was. And the oncologist would say, oh yeah, we're hearing about this at our conferences. It'll be published soon, right? So sometimes it falls on the neurologist, right? To say, what is this syndrome and know what tests to get to understand what these um, drugs are doing. Um, so it's myasthenia and or Guillain-Barre if we believe those reflexes and either way being treated as pembrolizumab toxicity. Wow, what a case. Um, well presented, Maria. Our thanks to Valeria for bringing it to us through you. Excellent discussion, Amir and Nikita. Nikita had the diagnosis from the chief concern. I uh, was in the DDX, right? And um, we all had an interesting journey together trying to be parsimonious here with um, where our lesion is and ultimately saying it's in the periphery, um, which was enough to solve this case, even if we couldn't get with precision with the information we had at the neuromuscular junction plus peripheral nerve um, or, or peripheral nerve. Fantastic. And then the, the, the hard question will now be um, for the oncologist, can this patient, does this patient need pembrolizumab? Is there an alternate therapy they can get? I'm not sure what's known about the cross reactivity. Can they get a different PD or PDL1 uh, inhibitor instead of this one? And how likely they are to have another neurologic problem? And the other question that always comes up in these is, was this patient destined for myasthenia anyway and had pre-existing 
acetylcholine receptor antibodies and the thymus was doing its whatever it does in myasthenia, getting angry at the, anti, at the acetylcholine receptors and the pembrolizumab accelerated the process or did the pembrolizumab create autoimmunity that um, led to this? And I think there are some studies looking at whether patients had, once people learned about this, looking for antibodies before and after um, if I'm not mistaken, but it's a new and rapidly evolving field. And I'm sure with, it's the kind of thing within months you search PubMed and there's five papers and then you search again in three months and there's 300 papers and you realize um, you're hoping for a review article soon to help you get caught up. Okay, other closing thoughts, questions? Nikita writes in the chat, still confused about the tendon reflexes. Yeah, maybe he got different chemo early on in the cancer and that's old, or maybe he has two things. Um, going on. We don't know. As in real life, often we don't. Yeah, one thing I realized after uh, listening to all the cases during all my CP uh, solvers, uh, attendance, I've seen that all diseases have different presentations. So it could be one of those situations where this could be just, you know, one uh, be duckling in between. Who knows? I don't know. That's right. Yeah, there's this sort of core we all learn about that would be in your step one, step two vignette. And then there's the fuzziness around that core where um, sometimes you're seeing a car go down the street and you say, wow, I've never seen a car that looks like that. And it's one of these old cars, right? And, it, and yeah, it didn't even recognize it as a car. But it doesn't fit into your typical concept of car. And similar these diseases, there's the straight down the middle presentation. And then there's the atypical presentations, right, that um, stump us. So um, excellent. Well, great case from Valeria, great presentation from Maria. And, um, oh yeah, teaching points. For those who are interested in sticking around, we've run over as is our custom in NeuroVMR, but Leah has been collecting some teaching points for those who might want to stay and, and learn from them and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, I'll highlight some of the important or main teaching points for this session. Uh, we had a discussion about causes of ketosis and um, there we want to highlight three main causes, which is um, disruptions with the cranial nerve three, the Horner syndrome, uh, where it's also important to exclude the possibility of parotid artery dissection and uh, myasthenia. And then in order to be able to differentiate between Horner and cranial nerve three palsy, we can think of, is this ptosis more subtle as it would be for Horner, or is the eye completely closed? And then also if the pupil is dilated, that would suggest a cranial nerve three palsy versus a meiosis would be more the Horner syndrome. And then we also talked about uh, complications of cancer together with neurologic symptoms. And you can think of three buckets, which would be um, direct compression of the tumor, and then also therapy complications um, or perineoplastic causes. And because this patient was on checkpoint inhibitors, we discussed possible um, side effects, which would be, or neurologic side effects, which would be Guillain-Barre, we can have myasthenia, um, hypophysitis, and then myocarditis, which then would be also non-neurologic um, causes. And then um, in this case, we were not quite sure whether what the diagnosis was in the end, but one of the pills um, that were shared was that when you treat checkpoint inhibitor Guillain-Barre syndrome, you use steroids, Whereas with the usual um, syndrome, you would do um, primarily plasma exchange therapy as well. And then, yeah, those were the main points for today. Fantastic, Leah. Thank you. I'm sure we will all be reaching for the latest review on immune checkpoint inhibitor associated neurologic conditions. There were several last time I've checked. I'm sure there are several more. You can get central complications, I believe also, but the peripheral are much more common. And there's a number of case series now and, and reviews. So keep these on your radar. Normally the ch chief concern in real life, right? Not in morning report, the way we do it here. Um, pembrolizumab would probably be in the chief concern, right? And would have biased slash anchored us from the beginning for, for better or worse. All right. Well, we're going to have a bit of a hiatus for a few weeks from neuro VMR. I you can't tell from my similarly blurred background, but um, I have uh, moved to start a new job, which I'm very excited about, and we'll start next Monday. And so I'm not quite sure what my schedule will look like, but once I'm uh, settled, oriented, we will um, figure out a good time to continue our neuro VMR, which um, I very much enjoy and learn so much from and enjoy spending this time with you. So 
Um, we'll take a few weeks summer hiatus, and um, then we will pick back up perhaps at a different time. So thanks, everyone. Um, collect some cases in the meantime, and we'll see you in a few weeks.